Our second scripture this morning is Luke 12, verses 13 to 21, where Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul? You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. So, okay, be honest. Are you one of those people that keeps things you don't really need? (laughs) Old greeting cards, gadgets, trinkets, souvenirs, things that don't even work anymore? I know. Maybe like me, you grew up hearing, waste not, want not. Or maybe that TV show, Hoarders, maybe that's about you. I'm sure somewhere I have books from high school. Not all of them, just the ones that I thought I might need again someday. And I know we have books from college and seminary and graduate school, plus the ones we keep buying. The late comedian George Carlin calls that our stuff. In Luke's Gospel, we find this parable about a farmer who accumulates stuff and plans to build a bigger barn to store not only his grain, but his goods, his stuff. Jesus is addressing a crowd of disciples and others when a man interrupts him and asks him to make his brother divide the family inheritance with him. Now, in those days, it was not uncommon to ask a rabbi to settle family disputes. The request probably came from a peasant, as wealthy families would not have resorted to seeking advice from a wandering teacher. But Jesus refuses to enter a family squabble 
smart and instead uses the situation to teach about greed. The farmer in the parable was not a criminal or a thief, but a rich person making provision for a comfortable future. Jesus calls him foolish not because he makes provision for the future, but because he believes that his wealth can secure his future. Jesus cautions the crowd not to aspire to be like the rich, who will soon realize that they don't even control their own lives. There is no clearer pronouncement of the old adage, you can't take it with you, than in the voice of God in this parable. You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Being rich toward God equals being charitable toward others, especially those in need. Jesus often showed sympathy for the poor and discussed with wealthy people who didn't display any concern for them. In fact, Luke could have repeated here a statement Jesus had made a couple of chapters earlier. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose themselves? And lest you think Jesus isn't talking about us, From a global perspective, every one of us is wealthy. My grandparents were born in the late 1800s. And I can remember going to their house and finding stockpiles of all kinds of goods, much more than they would ever be able to use. They particularly like to collect peanut butter and canned peaches. For them, I think it was generational, having lived through the Great Depression. But for some, hoarding becomes pathological, so much so that it has been classified as a psychological disorder by the Mayo Clinic. But Jesus calls it greed and suggests that it not only disregards the needs of others, but puts goods in the place of God. When we think only in terms of what we can get rather than what we can give, we are worshiping something other than God. But some who ought to know better still don't get it. Preachers of the gospel of happiness and prosperity fill the airways. They attract millions of viewers as well as millions in financial support. If you just send them your money, you will be blessed with great abundance. In their prosperity gospel, Jesus becomes the good friend who wants you to succeed. United Methodist Bishop William Willimon calls that a sort of sanctified form of Prozac. He doesn't see Jesus as that good friend who helps you get what you want, but rather as a constant challenge to what you think you want and need. Jesus' version of prosperity theology is to keep wealth in its proper place. Now, Jesus never says we can't enjoy the good things of life. He certainly did, and was supported by fairly wealthy women and others. He even gained a reputation with the Pharisees for overindulging. He enjoyed life, but he did not allow himself and his disciples too much in the way of material possessions. Jesus never says, beware of material things. 
He also does not say that being wealthy is wrong. True, he has said some pointed things about wealth, but the real culprit is greed. His warning is really to be careful that your possessions do not possess you. The German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, earthly possessions dazzle our eyes and delude us into thinking that they can provide security and freedom from anxiety. Yet all the time they are the very source of anxiety. There is a trend these days toward downsizing and simplifying our lives. Have you seen the tiny houses? Could you live in one of those? I'm talking to you people with big TVs. <laughs> Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus live in Missoula, Montana, not in a tiny house. They are known as the minimalists. And they write a blog about living a meaningful life with less stuff. Their blog has four million viewers, readers. This past week, in an interview on NPR, I heard Joshua say that minimalism is not just getting rid of stuff, but focusing on why the stuff was important to you to begin with and learning to let go of it. One of the paradoxes of Jesus' teaching is that we do not become rich by amassing possessions. We become rich by being charitable toward others. Some of the richest people in the world understand the need to do good with their wealth. I think of Bill and Melinda Gates who work through their foundation to make a difference in the lives of others, ordinary poor and needy people around the world. So the critical question that comes out of this parable is this. We achieve everything we have envisioned for our lives, store up all this stuff, we die, and then what? Some of us make provisions for our stuff to go to our families, who probably don't even want it. Even leave portions of our wealth to the church. Jesus says nothing against that, and it certainly is a blessing to the church. But we are called to do more to share our abundance with those in need here and now. Our lives have significance not in what we accumulate and leave when we're gone, but in light of God's love for us that inspires us to be generous in this life. For it is only as we recognize that gifts of wealth and worth are offered freely by God that we can hope to place our relative wealth in perspective and be generous with it toward others. And then, perhaps what we will need is not bigger barns, but bigger hearts. Amen.